Good morning, everybody. Let's uh, pray. We're going to get started. Father, we just thank you again for loving us the way you do, Father. Lord, as we uh, gather here today, Father, we just ask you to be with Waylon as he brings the song service. And Lord, we have in baptism this morning, Lord, we just ask that you're uh, glorified through this baptism, Father. And Lord, just be with each one of us as, uh, as we're as here in the church, Father, to, uh, to, to be the, the guidance that they need, Father, and, and these new Christians, Father, as they come into our church. Lord, help us to, uh, to be the ones to, uh, to lead them in the right way and teach them in the right way, Father. And Lord, just be with Brother Mike as he, uh, as he brings our lesson this morning, Lord. And Lord, just uh, may your word be taught this morning in everything we do. And may uh, you be glorified through the things that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today is, within the Southern Baptist Convention, is Baptism Sunday, believe it or not. And uh, one day out of the year, we kind of have a special focus on making baptism a, a priority. And uh, we have a couple of guys who've come today who've made new decisions about the Lord in their life. And uh, we're excited about them and their willingness to come today. And this is Daniel Altenberry. In fact, he and I were talking yesterday. And uh, uh, Daniel just told me he'd been dealing with the Lord about this for a while. And he just felt like there was an uncertainty in his life, he said that he said there'd been a lot of water under the bridge in the last few years, and he wanted to make sure he was where he needed to be with the Lord. And so, Daniel, do you feel like you've done that? Yes, you feel sir, like I you've do. made peace with the Lord? I do. I notice a different countenance in his life, even today, in talking to him, and uh, what a what a special treat it is. And Daniel and I go way back to high school days, and uh, in fact, I. Was had a part, I guess, in his life. He was getting saved back in high school, making a decision back there. And, uh, and so to get to baptize him today is a real treat for me. And so, Daniel, uh, not only are we friends, but I get to baptize you as my brother in the Lord today. And uh, what a joy that is. I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're buried with Christ and raised to walk in the newness of life. God bless you. Thank you. Cody, Daniel, and I are thinking about going in the tree removal business. You're hiring? We, we do quality work. We got experience, too. We cut down two trees, and one of them didn't hit the house. So we're quality if you want to have good health. And y'all know Mr. Steve Albritton, I know. I tell you what, this guy, I ain't never had anybody say, Preacher, are we ready to get baptized yet? Preacher, are we ready? I said, Steve, just wait. It's coming up in a few weeks. The Baptism Sunday. We're going to have a special Baptism Sunday. Preacher, you think you ready? we can go ahead and have that baptism this week? You know, and he, I believe he called me three times this week just to make sure we's having it today. And uh, I'm going to tell you something. This guy right here, God has touched his life. Amen. Amen. He walked down this aisle here a few weeks ago and said, Preacher, I'm not saved. I need to be saved. Now, I don't know what church it was that you supposedly been made a decision earlier in life and got baptized in. Was it here? McClendon. McClendon. At McClendon. And here, and here. But what's different this time? The Lord saved me. Amen. The Lord saved him, he said. You know, you know when it's real. You know when you've been born again. And today, Steve's made peace with the Lord. He said, now, Daniel told me a while ago, he just had a lot of uncertainties, and he just wanted to nail it down. He wanted to be sure about his salvation. But Steve said, listen, ain't no nailing it down. He said, I have lost, and this is the first time I've been saved. Do you know that today? Do you know that today? 
I'm going to tell you something, folks. I believe with all my heart the condition of this world, we're getting closer and closer to the Lord saying, that's enough. Just like he did back during the flood. He's getting closer and closer to saying, that's enough. In fact, if you used to get up out of your pew right now and say, Pastor, count me in. I want, I want to know I'm saved too. You run up here, we'll baptize you just like you are right now. Amen? Because you might die for next Sunday, or the Lord might come back for yeah, next Sunday. Don't, don't wait. Don't wait, Steve said. I tell you, that day he got saved, he walked down front, testified before the church, and, and uh, I'm just excited about what God's going to do in Steve's life. And so, Steve, my brother, you know that you're, you've made that decision to be with the Lord, to be right with Him. And so, I now baptize you as my brother in the Lord. What a privilege that is, Steve. Amen. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are buried with Christ and raised to walk in the newness of life. Amen. 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 Yesterday, I was visiting with Gary Stamper, who's had COVID, been in the hospital now for three or four weeks, and he's still in the hospital, hopes to come home this week. God has brought him through that, that uh, COVID and serious issues with that. Uh, but Gary, I just want to testify to you what Gary told me yesterday. He said, Preacher, when I get out of here, first time I'm back at church, you're going to baptize me. He said, because, he said, because, listen, he said, me and God's done a lot of talking while I've been in this hospital. And he said, I'm saved now. And he said, I've always sat back there in that corner and just went through the motions. He said, but when I get out of here, whatever that church needs done for the kingdom of God, he said, you count me in, I'm going to do it. And that's usually the test. That's the test whether somebody's really been changed, is whether or not God changes their desire to serve him and to worship him. So we're going to baptize old Gary when we get back out of here and uh, get, get him back into church. But I'm amazed at what God's doing, folks. God's up to some great things. And you may be the next person who God wants to have in here. Uh, this water doesn't save you, but he wants you to make a right decision with the Lord and then testify of his goodness in these waters. Amen? Brother Whalen. All right, we do have a lot of announcements, but I will be very brief. The main one is tonight. Right before the service, Daniel played for you a rendition from the Photo Sisters of I Can Only Imagine. They will be here tonight, three beautiful young ladies. They almost have that Celtic women kind of sound. You won't want to miss it. Uh, it is free. Bring your friends, your family, uh, your, your whole entire church. I'm looking over there to, yeah, bring, close your service and bring them all up here tonight, Mr. Marvin. It'll be a, a wonderful time, uh, so y'all be sure and, and promote that. Six o'clock tonight, they will be with us. We got some guys, if you can, at three o'clock, the, they will be here to set up, and so if you can come help with that, that will be wonderful. They are part of the senior adult re progressive revival that starts tomorrow. Um, tomorrow is at... First West, and they're singing in it, and then Tuesday, we have Young at Heart here, and then Wednesday, they will be at Highland Baptist, um, the revival will, so if you uh, want to be a part of that, do so. Hugh, tell us about Saturday. What's happening this Saturday with the bridge? Am I on? You are on. I'm on. We got a, our first block party for the bridge. It'll be at 6 o'clock. That's right, ain't it? Six, five, six. Y'all got to forget. It says six in the bulletin. Six o'clock. All right. Um, tell everybody, um, this is going to be a tool for our, uh, our bridge group to, and our church to reach the community. Um, it's going to be over there in, in the parking area, um, weather permitting. If not, we got a big old building over here. It's called the Old Sanctuary, and it's the bridge room. Uh, there's going to be live music and food, devotion, and uh, we're even going to watch a little video about how the gospel impacts our world. So, um, anyway, 6 o'clock, bring your appetite. <laughs>
Okay, Wayne has called a work day for the 25th of September. That is a th uh, Saturday. Breakfast comes back next Sunday. So biscuits will be back next Sunday. We have another week where we'll be uh, doing like we've been doing on Wednesday nights. You're welcome to come, but it'll also be televised. We won't do eating this Wednesday, but we'll bring it back the next Wednesday. So everything starts back to normal this next coming Sunday. The uh, sportsmen's banquet is approaching very quickly, and donations are needed. We are looking for someone to volunteer uh, contacting those businesses that have each year been very good about giving things for our silent auction and for the live auction. So if that's something you can take out and uh, take upon you and help divvy out those names, if you'll get with me or Brother Mike, we'll get you in the right direction. So those, uh, those things that we can put in the auction will be wonderful. All of that goes toward our uh, slaying the giant of getting rid of our building note. So, and we've got about that much left. So we, we would love to conquer it before the end of the year. All right, have I missed anything? Mike Love Day will be the, uh, he'll do singing for y'all at the Young at Heart. Do what now? Yes, he does a great job. You'll enjoy him. All right, let's stand together. Let's sing out loud. My life is in you, Lord, and my strength is in you, Lord, and my hope is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you. My life is in you, Lord, and my strength is in you, Lord, and my hope is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you. I will praise you with all of my life. I will praise you with all of my strength, with all of my life, with all of my strength. Oh, my hope is in you. My life is in you, Lord, and my strength is in you. Our drummer's supposed to play an introduction, and he's forgetting where he is. <laughs> I searched the world, but it couldn't, but it couldn't for pray fill me. We're going to start this all over again, y'all. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures of fame are never enough. And you came along and put 
put me back together Better than you There's nothing Here in your love Oh, there's nothing Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid. My failures and flaws, Lord, you sing them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is God in the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Nothing is better than you. Sing it out. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You turn morning, you turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one. turn graves into gardens, you turn bones into armies, you turn seas into highways, you're the only one who can, oh there's nothing better than you, there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you one more time oh there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you have a seat. Life. It's made of moments, mundane and memorable. Setbacks. Successes. They shape us. 
Every experience, every decision alters the course of our lives in ways big and small. But one moment towers above the rest, unleashing change that is massive, comprehensive, eternal. When we turn from our sin and believe in Him, Jesus changes everything. And though the earth may not quake, the heavens may not part overhead, make no mistake, inside, the old has died and the new has come. We are reborn from guilt to innocence, from slave and death to life. We are reconciled to God, made right in an instant. This is justification and it's the beginning of the Christian walk. A journey of sanctification that will not end this side of eternity. We take up our cross and follow Him, putting to death what is earthly and sinful in us and seeking the things that are above. We can't do it on our own, but by His grace, the power of His Word and the strength of His Spirit we're no longer conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewal of our mind, that by testing we may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. When we fall short, we run to Him and repent. And the evidence, the fruit of this new life, begins to blossom. In our relationships, we love our neighbor we think of others as more important than ourselves. Our habits change. We turn away from sin and walk in obedience to God's Word. We have new purpose. We live to glorify God, to love others, and to make disciples. These good deeds don't save us, but they are evidence that we have been saved because faith without works is dead. When the Son of God came to earth, He changed history. Time itself was split in two. When we trust Him with our life, the results are just as momentous and beautiful. Jesus changes everything.
can have all this world you can have all this world give me Jesus change my heart oh
That was beautiful. Thank you, guys. We're going to let the children go out for children's church at this time. Boy, it's good to look out there and see most of you. See a good crowd this morning. Looks like we're almost back to normal, huh? Things getting back to normal. Well, maybe we just have to learn to live with some of these health interventions every now and then. See how it goes. But uh, God's been good to us through all of this. And I think we'll just get stronger and stronger and more immunities from it uh, over time. We'll be in John chapter 12 this morning. John chapter 12, as I'm teaching through the book of John's gospel, we'll be beginning in verse 20 today down through verse 33. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 20 down through 33. The hour has come so many times. In this book and others, Jesus said, it's not my hour yet, it's not my time. And he had put off the announcement of his purpose in his coming. And uh, here we're seeing the last week of Jesus' life on earth. The crucifixion story is just uh, a few days off. And, and the, uh, it's time for his glory to be revealed. What you've seen in chapters 11 and 12 here gives us some hint of that. In the resurrecting of Lazarus from the dead in chapter 11 was a hint of who he was, the resurrection and the life. He's praised in that story as the son of David, which related him to Israel and his rightful place. To, he was a rightful heir to the throne in Israel. He could have literally taken the throne in Israel. And there in chapter 12, as he comes riding in on the colt uh, of a donkey, he is a fulfillment of Zechariah 9, 9, about the king who would come riding in on the back of that colt of a donkey. A fulfillment of that, and here, here as he comes in, he's glorified in chapter 11 as the Son of God also, but here in this chapter as the Son of God. Of man. Here we see him revealing his, his relationship to Israel as a Jew, as a rightful heir to the throne of the government of Israel, which we know one day he will come back and take that throne. Even the book of Daniel chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14 speak of the Son of Man coming in the clouds, and he will take up his rightful place in the kingdom of on earth. And he says, of that kingdom there will be no end. So the prophet Daniel prophesied it way back there in the Old Testament. Isaiah had many prophecies about when the king would come. And so here we look today in chapter 12, beginning here in verse 20 of chapter 12 of John's gospel, and we're reminded of what that kingdom would be made up of. Now, as you know, much uh, has been said of Scriptures about how He came to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles or the Greeks. Here we see the beginning uh, of the uh, grafting in, if you will, of the Gentiles, people like you and I, into the body of Christ, into the family of God. And you see that at the same time, there is being a, uh, a breaking off, so Romans calls it. He, he refers to it in Romans as a, a big wild olive tree, the family of God, the kingdom of God. And he says in there that the Jewish, the nation of Israel, would be, had been broken off. Does that mean God didn't love them? No, it meant that God was going to move on because the Jews had refused to carry the gospel of Christ. They were given that opportunity to take it to the world. And instead, they set up their regulations and their religious ceremonies and said they were the only ones that God loved. In Isaiah, it talked about it in chapter 11, how that Jesus would be a light unto the Gentiles. In John, I'm sorry, in Luke's gospel, chapter 2, we see also where Luke tells the story of uh, Simeon there in the temple about how that Jesus would be the salvation of the nations, a light unto the Gentiles. Time and again we see that, but we see, we're see we seeing right now, as was said back in chapter 11, 
Look back in chapter 11. Before we read these verses, look back at John chapter 11, if you would. Just a little bit uh, prior to that. Uh, John chapter 10, I'm sorry, chapter 10 and verse 16. Back one more chapter. He talks about, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. That's other, those other sheep are talking about the Gentiles. It's talking about those that are not Jewish. And so here we see that grafting in that takes place here of the church. And uh, the Jews, the Gentiles, I'm sorry, the Gentiles and the Greeks here in verse 20 are the ones who now come to Jesus at this worship feast and are saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. The Bible says there's something going on. The Bible says that there is a, Matthew 13 talks about it a lot in verse 15, about there being the Jewish people becoming dull of hearing and losing their sight. He's talking about them spiritually. They are in that process of God is beginning to take His priority of, of building the family of God and, and going to move that priority away from the Jewish people, and they're going to be cut off, the book of Romans says. And God's going to graft in a new group of people. Not that God doesn't love the Jews. In fact, uh, He's still got the Jews on a time clock. In fact, we know that the last seven years on the Jewish time clock is going to be the seven years tribulation. I don't want to get over your head. I'm not trying to get too far. We, I've taught this to you on Revela in our study on Revelation. But I want you to know that God's not through with the Jewish people. He still loves the Jewish people. In fact, there will be a, a mass evangelist, Jewish evangelism movement in those days, in those latter days, where there will be 144,000 Jewish evangelists, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, and they will evangelize the world during that tribulation period. There will be a great move of God during that period. But I'm saying to you today, we have now been given a, an opportunity to join in on that family of God. And that's why you're here this morning. You're here because the Gentiles eventually said, we want to see Jesus. We want to meet with Jesus. We want to know Jesus. And the Jews had refused that task of carrying the gospel to the world. So God broke them off and He grafted us in. And the Bible says that we need to be careful because realize He can break us off too if He needs to. And so, but God's going to graft them back in one day is all I'm trying to say to you. And we're seeing this particular place where God is beginning to break off the Jewish people and began to, do, to have a new movement among the Gentiles. And we see it kind of introduced here. I mentioned it a little bit to you last week in the message. Would you stand with me if you can, if you feel like it, in honor of the reading of God's Word, beginning in verse 20 down through verse 33. Now, there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. And then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip came and told Andrew, and turned Andrew, and Philip told, in turn, they told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will also be. And if anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that they had heard thunder. And others said an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out, and I am lifted up. And if I am lifted up out from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. This, he said, signifying by what death he would die. Fathers, we read these scriptures this morning. We're reminded of the 
purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're reminded of His coming, Lord, and, and His whole mission and His task on this earth to give His life a ransom for many. Oh, God. God, that we might realize the price that was paid for our salvation. God, that we might realize that Jesus came to be glorified and to glorify the Father and to give us an opportunity to taste of that glory. God, not that we would get glory, but God, that we just get to have your glory in some part of it in us, Lord. As Jesus lives in us and as the Holy Spirit empowers us, Lord, today, move on these who hear my voice today, Lord. Let them hear your voice, God. Let them hear your message that on this day, God, these who are sitting in this place and these who may watch these service by uh, the technology that's out there, Lord God, may Jesus be high and lifted up in this place. And Lord, if he is high and lifted up, I pray that he will draw people to him. That it's only through him we might understand that people can be saved. So, Lord, have your way today in this service is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. Well, there's so much this morning in this Scripture. So many. I could just take one verse here and there and preach whole sermons out of just a verse or two here and there. But out of this text this morning, I want to show you four specific things that come from this text today. First of all, Jesus is sought by the Gentiles. These first three verses, we see the Greeks or the Gentiles. Uh, the Bible kind of breaks down all of mankind into two categories, the Jews and the Greeks, or the Jews and the Gentiles. And so it's saying there that, that there is now someone non-Jewish that's coming. God's beginning to draw them, and, and no one comes to the Lord unless they're drawn by the Lord. And God's beginning to draw the Gentiles. Let me just tell you back a little history on this. Back in uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, we see Jesus warns that the disciples were not to go the way of the Gentiles. What was the way of the Gentiles? Well, if you were to look at the way of the Gentiles, it was pretty much a, pretty much a heathen way of looking at things. They were, they were outside of the Jewish people. They, they, they were looked at as those who did not have the opportunity to really know God in the way that the Jewish people did. Uh, there were those who had practiced hedonistic ways of life and, uh, and knew not God. They were pagans. They had practiced idolatry. But here we see the effect of when the Spirit of God begins to convict people of their sin, how that He will draw people to the Heavenly Father. He will draw people to Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 2, though, we see things change when he said in verse 32, Simeon there in the temple said that he would be a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles. As he held up the baby Jesus there right after his birth, he said he would be a light to bring revelation or understanding to the Gentile people. Oh, my friend, that was good news for you and for me. We had no hope unless the light and the revelation came to the, Jew, to the Gentile people. And so here we see God is at a fresh work. These, these Greeks that were coming now, these were some of the first fruits, if you will. In fact, we're referred to those New Testament saints there, those that were, we read about in the, the New Testament scriptures that got saved, were some of the first fruits of a future great coming resurrection one day. One day there'd be a great salvation of souls. And we see those now that are being, that are being saved during this period of time. Uh, we see them as those first fruits, those first blessings of God upon the Gentile people. And so we look at this today. We are, we are amazed when, uh, when Israel is now at a place where they're ready to kill him, the Gentiles are saying, Oh, we want to see him. We want to talk to him. We want to embrace him. And what a change was taking place. Jesus is sought by the Gentiles. The second thing I want you to see is Jesus signals his glorification. He signals his purpose for coming here in this text in verses 23 and 24. It says there in verse 23, But Jesus answered, saying to them, My, The hour has come. So many times we had waited for that hour when Jesus had put off revealing completely, at least, 
who he was. And he say, I, and, and really he gives us a, a full theology of salvation in verse 24. He said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Now what's Jesus talking about there? He's talking about the importance of you and I fully understanding salvation. First of all, Jesus says, for me to be multiplied, for what my, the vision that I have is to be multiplied. And to do that, he said, you've got to take your life and give it away. And Jesus was talking about his own crucifixion, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And he knew that through that resurrection that there would be a multiple of, of followers that would be redeemed and would be the church. I want you to understand something, folks. This isn't just a principle, though, for Jesus Christ. It's a principle for you and I. It's a principle of salvation. It's a principle that says that salvation is when you and I are willing to come to the end of ourselves and we're willing to die. Your old self, your old nature has to be willing to die. If there's anything wonderful, if there's anything great comes out of your life, It'll not be because you held on to your life, but it'll be because you gave it away. Please understand that. Get this biblical principle. Anything you hold on to, you're going to lose. And anything you're willing to lose, God says you can have for eternity. Think about that principle. What are you holding on to? Sometimes we're holding on. We, we're holding on to things, and uh, we're, we're holding on to gold and riches. And, and listen, you're going to lose it all. You're going to leave it behind. Now, that, now that's a, uh, uh, something that's just a reality. You can't take it with you. But the fact is, the things that we give away, we can hold on to because we've given them away. They, because God will take them. And it's really the principle of gardening, isn't it? Several of you gardeners here, you know that, that, that you can take one little piece of corn, one little grain of corn, and you can bury it out there and fertilize it a little bit. And how many grains, how many pieces of corn or, or grain of corn will grow from that one stalk of corn? I don't know. How many, how many ears of corn can you get on one stalk? Three or four? Two? Two? All right, whatever it may be, it's not a lot, is it? But how many, how many grains of corn is on just one ear of corn? It's just multiple, isn't it? Thirteen rows? Brother Ray, I've been doing lots of things in my life, but I ain't been counting how many rows of corn is on, on, <laughs> on an ear of corn. I tell you what, amen. Amen. Uh, but that's, that's, a, that's interesting. That's, I mean, that's how many stripes we got on the flag, isn't it? And, and, uh, but... Uh, you know, I think about that. How many, one little piece of corn can develop, let's say, a thousand pieces of corn. But it's got to die first. You put that piece of corn in your pocket, put it in a drawer somewhere, nothing's going to happen with it. It's only when it's buried and it's resurrected will it multiply. You see, Jesus did that. He paved the way for us. And that's what you have to do in your life. You've got to give it away. You've got to die to yourself. And you know one of the reasons a lot of people, like Mr. Steve and him coming in here, getting baptized this morning, and Daniel, you know a lot of times we come to church, and we take our life, we take our piece of corn, and we bring it in here, and we still kind of hold on to it, don't we? We don't really give it to the Lord. We may fill out a piece of paper. We may get dunked in the water. But let's be honest. You know in your heart whether or not you gave the Lord your seed. Whether or not you were willing to die and give your life for Jesus. To the cause of Christ. You know, Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, you've got to be willing to to deny yourself. Picture of death. You've got to be willing to take up your cross daily and follow me. Those are pictures of surrender. Those are pictures of death. So, so a couple of things about this. The plan, the hour had come. It was time to be glorified. That's the first thing in your outline under this point, the plan. God had a plan. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. He had one plan. He didn't have two plans. He didn't have an A plan, and if that doesn't work, then maybe we'll have a B plan. He just had one plan. And that plan was for you and I to be totally bought, purchased, redeemed, set free, 
and empowered to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Jesus had to be glorified so you and I could be glorified. Listen, only those that have been glorified are going to be able to make it to heaven. You understand that? Now, there's nothing glorious about us, is it? But I'm going to tell you, in fact, everything about us, in fact, the Bible says there's none good, no, not one. There's nothing good about us. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, the Bible says. But God imputes to us. After He takes our sins and washes them away, then God stamps us with His righteousness. And I'm going to tell you something. There's a little glory in that. Amen? Otherwise, you couldn't worship if you didn't have a little glory to worship. Amen? It's God that's glorious, but it's the Spirit of God in you that helps us be filled with the, the be touched by the glory of God. I'm here to tell you something. It is that glory. It is that glory that God wants to see on your face when you stand at the gates of heaven. It is that glory that God's looking for to know that you're a child of God, to know that you've been touched by Jesus Christ, and to know that you've been declared. You've been declared righteous, not because you earned it, not because you're worthy of it, but God just stamped you one day and said, Worthy, glorified, righteous. And God gave you the ticket that was needed to get into heaven one day. That was God's plan. And then there was that process. The second thing under, under number two was the process, that, that farming law, if you will. First of all, let it go. That's the first thing you got to do. You got to let it go. Friends, hey, if you're going to save your life, you're going to have to lose it. That's what he's telling us here in this text. If you're going to save your life, you're going to have to lose it. That's what verse 25 says. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Oh, my friend, God says salvation. You see, we think salvation is joining the church. It's not. We think salvation is just believing that there's a God. It's not. The Bible says the demons believe that and they tremble because of it. The demons know there's a God. The devil knows there's a God. Just because you think there's a God or you believe there's a God is not enough to save you. You see, when you walk that aisle, you give your life away. Yes. Corinthians, Paul said in Corinthians, he said, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body, which is the Lord's. You see, that's what salvation is. It's when you say, God, as, as unworthy as I am, God, as, as, as God, as I just feel like I don't have anything to offer you, but God, I want to give it to you. I, I've pulled some old seeds out. They actually found some seeds in a tomb of a Roman, I mean, of an of a, of a Egyptian pharaoh. The oldest seeds, in, I forget how many, a few thousand years old. And guess what? They took them out and planted some of them, and they came right up. Can you believe that? That something could be that worthless, that old, that dead, that dry? Put it in the ground, and about a week later, it'll come to life. And friends, unless you take your life and put it in the ground and give it to God, you will never have what God has available to you. Religion won't do it. Church won't do it. Being a good person won't do it. Only Jesus will do that for you. But you've got to be willing to let it go. But here we see Jesus says he shows his plan to be glorified. But you've got to let your life go. You've got to plan it and God will multiply it. Is there somebody, I, I say that, I say God will multiply your life. Has your life been multiplied since you got saved? Is there some other people? I, I'm going to tell you what. Do you know what? Since you got saved, some of you may not even know it. You may not even know who got saved because of your life. Some folks got saved because you're a tither and you help provide a church and you helped a church function. And people that get saved, every time somebody gets saved in this church, guess what? You get to be a part of that. That's part of your life. Every time something like that happens. And so what a great event to know that, that God is taking your sacrifice and multiplying it in other people's lives. What if this church didn't exist? What if this church hadn't been here this morning? Now, I don't have enough Calvinism in me to believe it. God would have worked it out anyway. We're all a bunch of robots. 
God's going to do what he wants to do anyway. God doesn't matter. I, I don't know. I, I don't know how God would have done it, but I know this. I'm sure excited that this church was here. And I'm excited that two guys got baptized this morning and made their life right with the Lord and made sure they were right with the Lord. And we all get to be a part of that. We all get to share in that. Hey, folks, that's what it's all about. Do you know that in the Southern Baptist Convention this morning, we have over 40,000 churches, but do you know that a fourth of those churches or 20 to 25% of those churches will not baptize one person this year? Not one. I'm like, how can you not baptize one person? Even the preacher ought to get out and find one person needs to get saved. I'm going to tell you, I've been minister, I've been pastor now for 36 and a half years, Brother Whalen. And I believe if it was getting close to the end of that deadline and nobody got saved, I'd go out there and find me an old hound dog running through the parking lot. I'd baptize that hound dog. Somebody's going to get baptized this year. Amen? Sake of, the waters has got to part. Amen? If I had to go find an old hound dog, I don't know if we'd count it. I don't know if they'd take it, but I'd probably count it. I don't know. But i tell you, I, I can't imagine going through a whole year and nobody coming to know Jesus Christ. But that'll happen in one out of five churches this year. I can't imagine. I guess if I had strong enough beliefs, it just, well, well, God just didn't want nobody to get saved in this church this year. No, I don't believe that. God's doing everything He can to get as many people as He can saved. He needs willing messengers to get out there. He said, the, from the foolishness of preaching, that people are saved. Amen? And when we're not preaching, folks aren't going to get saved. And so we got to tell the story. Look at number three in your outline this morning. Jesus requires a submission for godliness. And this kind of ties in. I read verse 25 already about losing your life. If you're going to save it, you're going to have to lose it. You're going to have to give it away if it's going to ever be anything. Verse 26, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. I told you all what Gary Stamper told me yesterday. I bundled up and went in that hospital on the COVID wing. and Don't nobody freak out. I ain't got to be quarantined. He don't have it. And I had enough garb on me. They had me wrapped up in them plastic things. I felt like a fish stick in there for a little while. I had, a, I had masks on and shields on and gloves on. And I, I started sweating like a dog. I thought I was going to pass out sitting in there talking to Gary. I had so much stuff on. But I'm going to tell you what Gary said. Here's what he said. And no, I didn't mention it to him, but he said, when I get back out of this hospital, he said, you're going to baptize me, preacher. He said, you're going to baptize me. He said, because me and Jesus have been doing lots of talking in here, and Gary Stamper saved now. He wasn't when he came in here. But yes, guess what Gary said? And he said, anything God wants me to do up there, anything needs to be done in the kingdom of God, just let me know because I'm here. I'm going to do it. Now, I love old Gary to death, but... Gary ain't never signed up to be in the work day. Gary ain't never signed up to, to come help here and teach. I, I may have Gary teaching a class. I need somebody to teach a class. Now, Gary might draw the line on that. I don't know. But, but anyway, but I'm going to tell you what he said. He said, I want to serve God. There's no greater sign that you've been born again than you want to serve God. I'm going to tell you, I... Some folks, you know, if, if you go visit them, they'll come to church. But if you don't visit them in three or four weeks, they won't come again. And you got to go beg them again. And you got to go beg them again. I'm going to tell you something. You know what? You don't have to beg folks who get a good dose of Jesus. If they get a good dose of Jesus, man, you won't have, you, you'll have to tell them. I remember when old uh, James back there got saved. James wanted to know when the WMU met. He wanted to meet with the women. He, just, he wanted to meet with everybody. You know, he wanted to know what was next. You know, when can I come to church? He was disappointed we didn't come but four days a week up here. You know, and, and was, you know, that's the way it ought to be. When you fall in love with Jesus, you want to be involved with what God's doing. I believe that with all of my heart. You believe that? I believe God's in that business. And, and so here we see, what do you want to do with your life reveals who you love in verse 25. It reveals who you love. And, and, and when you follow with your life, it glorifies your leaders. It glorifies your leaders. Here's what I mean by that. Listen, when you serve Jesus, it brings glory to Him. You want to know how to glorify Jesus? Just worship Him. I've told you all this a number of times. I'm going to say it again. I say it enough. I hope you'll remember it. But the words worship and serve can be translate, trans, 
place in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, you can use the same word and, and translate it both ways. Hey, when you want to bring glory to Jesus Christ, serve Him. Serve Him. Well, preacher, I don't understand serving Him. Let me tell you something. Jesus said every time there's somebody out there in a need, if you help somebody, maybe, maybe there's somebody that works with you and they ain't got food on their table, and you go buy them a bill of groceries, guess what you just did? You just served Jesus. Now, let me make a suggestion, though. When you, when you take them those groceries, don't say, well, I did this because I'm the best guy in our workplace. I, I, I want everybody to know I'm the best man there. No, you take them those groceries and say, I'm doing this in Jesus' name. It's for Him. It's not for me. He wanted me to help you do this. You see, and that's what God's, that's what we're all about. That's what God's, do things that point people to Jesus Christ. And so here we see, that is the, that is the process as you serve Him, you will bring glory to Him. Man, I'm out of time, and I didn't even realize the time was gone. I have fun preaching. I don't know if y'all have fun listening, but I have fun preaching, all right? Let's conclude with this. Let's finish up the last one. Jesus' substantial gift of grace. Those last few verses, 27 through 33, so much information there. But, but let me just say this. Jesus was under the burden of the cross. Hey, this shows us the Son of Man side of Jesus. He was fully man, even though He was fully God. I can't fully understand that, can you? But He was fully man and fully God. And this was the human side of Jesus, realizing the pain of the cross. There would be a lot of pain on the cross, but there's one other thing I think Jesus dreaded most about the cross. He knew all of our sins was going to be placed on Him. He had never known sin. He had never experienced sin other than the hatred of others. And I believe the thing that that he knew that the Father was going to have to look away because when he became sin for us, the Bible says the Father had to look away. And friend, I want you to know, I think he dreaded that the most. Becoming sin for us. When I look at this story, I, I think there's two things. There's a in these earlier parts of this chapter, we see the outward jubilation, the celebration of, of His coming as King. And here we see the inward tribulation. We see that this task would not be easy. Listen, Jesus paying for your sin and my sin was not an easy task. It was a tough job. Because He knew that He would bleed out on that cross. Can you imagine being beaten? The Bible says beaten beyond, I'm going to put it in modern translation, beyond recognition. His visage, it says, was marred beyond recognition, in other words. Meaning he was beaten so... In fact, if I, I, I've, I've read scientific studies on the abuse of the cat of nine tails, uh, being beaten and the bone that's inside of that leather straps, that typically when you receive the, the beating, the scourging of the, the cat of nine tails, when they finish your ribs... Are visible. Your rib bones are visible. It rips all the meat and hide and muscle off of your back and your ribs. It would wrap around you and they would jerk it back and it would tear all the meat and hide off of your muscles. He endured that for you and for me. He endured the, the nails driven in his hands and his feet for you and me. He endured the, the taking of the, the crown of thorns and placing it on his head. And beaten, if you do a study, it means to beat it with bamboo sticks. Beating it down so that those long thorns stick down in the temple and in the eyebrows. I mean, it wasn't just like they just set a little nice little crown of thorns on his head. They beat those thorns into his head. And all he had to do was look to heaven and he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and to set him free. But instead, 
Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says, He endured the cross for the joy that was set before Him. Joy? What joy? I'll tell you what the joy was. The joy that was set before him was seeing those two guys get in that baptistry this morning and make a public profession of their faith. The joy that was set before him was seeing little children get saved and moms and dads get saved and families be put back together. The joy that was set before him was one day to know that in heaven, in the new heaven, in the new earth, that it would be full of people who were redeemed and righteous and made right with God. And that heaven wouldn't be a lonely place. But instead, there'd be the sound of the little children running and the beauty of holiness. What God wanted the earth to be in the beginning, but man had messed it up. Heaven would again be like. That was the joy that was set before him. Oh, my friend, is that your joy this morning? You see, when, I, when we get saved and when we're walking in the Spirit of God, there's a joy that, that causes us to come to church, that joy that we get to be a part of. That joy called heaven, that joy of, of finding a, somebody that works with us who's lost and an alcoholic and going to hell, the, the joy of maybe seeing them come to faith in Christ and seeing their life get turned around. The joy of knowing that no matter how crazy the politicians are in Washington, D.C., they don't decide about my tomorrows. My tomorrows are decided already by God. Amen? You see, that's the joy I have. It's, isn't it tickle you to death to know Joe Biden's not in charge of your life? Amen? He ain't even in charge of his own life. It tickles me to death just to know that God has got this. Amen? And I don't have to worry about Washington, D.C. to run things. To know that God's got this. Helps me get up in the morning and put a smile on my face. You see, if I'm down and depressed and discouraged and frustrated and crying about life, I'm not living my faith. My faith says, I believe, therefore, I am filled with the joy of the Lord. Oh, my friend, do you have the joy of the Lord in your life? It only comes with Jesus. Brother Waylon, y'all come. Musicians, you come. God. Hey, folks, the joy that was set before the Lord is the same joy that can be before you and I. Man, God is up to something. When I see God saving people, and I see people, I see, I tell some people sometimes, and you know who, you know who gets saved in most churches? Little children and youth. And we have some children, and we have some youth that's been saved here. But I'm going to tell you, there ain't much, there's something that doesn't happen in a lot of churches, and God's been doing here. It's, it's older folks getting saved. Folks in their 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. Folks getting saved. That's what God's up to, folks. I believe that's a special place God's got for our church. There's a special place. God's, God's doing something here right now. And if that don't create a little joy in you, something's wrong with the joy meter in your life. Would you bow with me? Invitation time right now where God calls people. And, and I'm going to ask you to get up out of that pew in a minute. If you're not saved, I'm going to ask you to walk down here and take me by the hand. You say, preacher, why do I need to do that? Because the Bible says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you. If you've never done that, if you've never publicly professed your faith in Jesus Christ, if you've never asked Him to, to, to come take your life, say, Jesus, I, I just want to give my life to you, Lord. I, I want to live for you. I want to serve you. I want to follow you. I want to love you. I want to worship you. Jesus, today, cleanse me, and I'm going to become your follower. Hey, friends, that's what salvation is. I don't know what all special words you think you have to use, 
but it's really just a change of ownership. Would you come this morning? Would you come this morning and say, I'm not ashamed of Jesus. If you've never been saved this morning, that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to come and and say, Jesus, it's no longer about me. It's about you. I want to follow you. Father, we give this invitation into your hands. Lord, there's some here this morning who maybe God aren't saved. And God, they need to come this morning and, and be unashamed and show their willingness to stand up for Jesus. And then there are those, Lord, today who maybe need to come who've never been baptized since they got saved. And God, they need to come make a decision to follow you in believer's baptism. And then, Lord, there may be some here who've never joined this church and they want to put their membership here this morning. God, you help them to take that step of faith and walk out here and say, I want to be part of the team. God, whatever it may be, come to the altar. Some may need to pray, Lord. You just need to talk with them on the altar, Lord, whatever it may be. Have your way right now, Lord, is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender humbly at his feet I bow worldly pleasures all forsaken take me Jesus take me now I surrender I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender. Make me Savior, holy Thine. Let me fill Thy Holy Spirit. Truly know that Thou art mine. I surrender all. I Amen. That's what we want to do. Surrender it all to the Lord. If we want all to be blessed, then we need to surrender it all to the Lord. I want to ask some of you to be a friend to Brother Danny. I don't think it's fair to make him sit back here right by himself in a whole section of the church. I don't know if he hasn't had a bath today or what the problem is, but somebody be a friend to Brother Danny before you leave. I don't know what it is, but uh, <laughs> don't have friends nowhere. <laughs> hey, Seldom do we get the opportunity to have a, a, a musical group like the Photo Sisters to be with us. They're going to be here tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, if you weren't in here at the beginning of the service, you didn't get to see their video. They play a lot of different instruments. 
they're I'm not sure. I think they're from Baton Rouge or somewhere South Louisiana, and uh, but they're going to be singing at the Senior Adult Revival this week. They're singing at First West this morning. Going to be here tonight. I, can I ask all of you something? When pastors stamp out, you know, they made it available. If some church wanted to book them tonight, I said, man, we'd be glad to have them. They can come out here. I don't want to show up and there'd be 30 people here. You know, that makes us all look bad. So I hope you'll show back up tonight, okay? Show back up. Make, a, make an exception. Be here tonight because I don't want, to look, I don't want us to look bad <laughs> because we bring somebody in to sing and nobody be here. So I hope you'll be here. Six o'clock tonight. And uh, you're going to get a blessing. They're really, really talented. And uh, a couple of them are in their mid-20s, and they're not married. So if I was a single guy, I might would want to be here. I might would want to make that meeting. So uh, anyway, <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Some of you wives are going to make your husband stay home. I know that. That's <laughs> what's going to happen. But uh, don't you do that. You be here tonight, all right? Anything else need to be announced? Need to remind anybody about anything else. Don't forget this week, uh, Senior Adult Revival tomorrow at First West. I think it's at 10 o'clock. I think it's at 10. Then they have lunch afterwards. And then Tuesday, they're having it over at North Monroe. But we don't want to go over in that part of town. So we're just going to have our own Young at Heart right here. Amen. We have our own revival right here. And then Wednesday, it's at Highland and West Monroe. Uh, if you'd like to go back to that Wednesday. And so uh, plan to be here. All things going on this week. Praise God for all the good things he's doing. Brother Marvin, so good to see you and the wife here today. Pray for us, you and Miss Shelley. God, pray for us. Amen.